is Sarah Overton. I'm the production manager for the Dream Unfinished, and I'm joined today by Ed Lee, who is the executive director and co-founder of the Dream Unfinished. Um, so I'm so excited to be talking with him uh, about just how this unique concept for orchestra, for an activist orchestra, got started. We'll be talking about the founding of TDU, how our inaugural concert and its centerpiece selection really resulted in the name of the organization. Yeah, so I, I do think we should kind of, I will organize myself in, in talking about the founding of TDU and then also diving more deeply into the, the Plain Chant for America specifically and how it showed up in our naming. And I loved that theory that you just said earlier, Sarah, around like pointing out that Plain Chant can be, even though it's one melodic line, it is many voices singing one. And maybe we should talk about that a little bit more. But but so yes, how TDU was founded. So, um, so this goes back to 2014. And um, as folks may know, currently I am employed as an arts administrator, but in 2014, I was a teaching artist. Um, and so I was doing early childhood music. I was uh, teaching woodwinds and I was doing kind of the classic teaching artist thing. Like I was also a barista, like just this kind of patchwork portfolio uh, career. And um, I, 2014 was when Black Lives Matter really became mainstream, became something that was being regularly reported about in um, in in news outlets. And um, I, and obviously, uh, I, I think the whole country in that moment was kind of swept in this. Um, well, let me let me rephrase that. I would say that um, there was a much broader awakening and awareness to these kinds of issues um, nationally than I think had been in play prior. And um, so I would count myself as one of those people who, um, it was really through BLM that I um, just honestly even became aware of things like police brutality. And so, you know, a lot of it, first of all, it was just me kind of getting square with myself. Like, I lived a certain kind of life where I could get away with not having to know about these sorts of things and not having to have these kinds of conversations about these topics with the people that I knew. Um, so, so, so some of it was, you know, frankly, deeply personal. And, and what I was experiencing, I think, was ex experienced just on a broader scale. Um, but then I think some of it also was specific to my practice as a musician um, and wondering, you know, particularly because at the time I was um, teaching um, in, in, a, in, a, in a, a, like a children's orchestra program. And, you know, this is true, I think, of many music education initiatives um, where there is this kind of narrative around how, you know, Mozart can save kids <laughs> or um, and, and that's true, not only of very large arts institutions, but also very small ones. Um, and, and particularly the, in a more popular narrative in the last, I would say, 10, 15 years of like social change through music. And a lot of these nonprofit organizations are, you know, branding themselves as being vehicles for social change in their communities and, and serving, uh, you know, black and brown children and putting the faces of these children all over their marketing materials. Um, but then like in 2014 and 2015, none of these organizations were really publicly making any kind of statements around these topics that, you know, um, uh, these are topics that are supposed to be impacting the very communities that they're claiming to serve. So there was just a lot of questioning too around that part of, you know, our, what it was happening in terms of the kind of broader field and sector around me. So, so with these kinds of realizations um, for a time, really, I would say at least a couple of months, um, maybe even three months or so, I was doing a lot of weird Google searches. Um, I was searching for, you know, Black Lives Matter classical music, <laughs> Black Lives Matter orchestra. Um, because frankly, you know, at the time, as I said, I was early childhood music, um, woodwind teaching artists. So I was 
I was playing the clarinet and I was singing with babies. And I assumed that like, if someone was already doing something about this, then it would be really cool to hitch onto that bandwagon because like, surely I couldn't do anything, um, you know, of my own. And so I did all these weird Google searches and was really coming up with very little. And so then one day I, at the time I was actually still on Facebook. And so I posted a Facebook post saying like, is there anything that classical musicians can do right now? Um, and there was actually, you know, quite a bit of uh, brainstorming in that post. And then there was a suggestion from Richard Miller of Upbeat NYC, which is a wonderful organization in the Bronx. You should definitely check them out if you're a big fan of music education. But um, Rich Miller had suggested, like, what if we did a, some sort of benefit concert for different civil rights organizations that are related to doing these kinds of topics? And um, that was basically the inaugural concert. It was, a, it was conceived as a one-off. It was conceived as we're gonna do this one thing, this one time. Um, and frankly, none of us knew what we were doing. So like we hadn't applied for any grants, like, like we, and the music program in hindsight was so ambitious. Like I think we had something crazy, like six timpanis on the stage. I mean, like, like it was, <laughs> It was, it was, it, there were no sorts of um, practical <laughs> reasons that were put into question as far as trying to assemble this thing. Um, so we didn't know what we were doing, but people just felt so passionate about it. And we ended up with this 96 piece orchestra. So for people who aren't aware, that meant there were almost a hundred humans on stage. Um, and there were people who, um, you know, play with the New York Philharmonic, play with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, play in Broadway pits. So extremely high caliber of professional. And they all played for free. Uh, you know, we had a day of rehearsals prior and then the actual concert and they, um, they all volunteered their time completely. For, for this event. And it was this crazy event and like the people who, this this sort of loose collective of people who had organized it, like none of us had slept into Sunday two hours leading up to it. Um, and it was supposed to be a one-off, but it was also, not only did it have this incredibly ambitious musical program, but um, it sort of birthed the format of most TDU concerts, which is embedding music with speakers. So uh, that really began our really wonderful relationship with the Center for Constitutional Rights. Uh, Vince Warren, who is their ED, he was our keynote um, and uh, just was such a passionate and inspiring speaker and now thankfully a member of our board and we do all sorts of great things with CCR. Um, also very notably as included in the speakers in that evening, um, it was Erica Garner, uh, daughter of Eric Garner. And really his passing was um, in many ways a direct catalyst to the founding of the Dream Unfinished just because I think it was the New York City response to um, what happened with his with his passing that um, I think helped to galvanize some of the work around this. And for those who are not aware, so Erica Garner became quite a prominent activist um, in in light of her father's passing, but then she actually passed away in the last couple of years. So um, we were very fortunate and very lucky to have been able to work with her for that that um, that event. And um, so it was supposed to be this one-off event. It was this beautiful event. I still remember that first concert as, it was, it was electric. It was, you could feel the sort of synergy that was existing between the people in the audience and the people on stage. Um, but it was supposed to be a one-off event. And so, you know, again, we had these musicians who had all played for free. And for, for those who don't know, generally after a lot of these classical music gigs, like. The musicians, after it's done, they will just kind of pack up and leave, right? <laughs> like they, they sometimes have another gig. They, they, or their, their, you know, their services are are complete. Um, but this was an instance where many of the musicians like really wanted to hang around afterwards. Like they wanted to digest. Like we all sort of collected in this tiny bar that was right next to the venue, and like they were like talking about how they experienced the music and the, and the performance. And then a bunch of them that night and then the days afterwards are saying, okay, so when are we gonna do this again? And that's when I realized that we had really sort of hit a nerve. Um, and I think frankly, 
it, some of it was also serendipitous in that, you know, not only was this a broader conversation that we were having nationally, but certainly there have been earlier versions of this, but I would say since 2014 and slightly earlier, now it's become a much more active conversation in the field of classical music. So us sort of coming on at this time, I think helped to, like there was already sorts of like momentum that kind of culminated into us deciding that this needed to be more than a one-off. Um, so then we had our subsequent concerts and slowly sort of professionalized more into um, like a collective into a 501c3. Uh, and now we're, and now we're budding YouTubers. So I think the project continues to evolve. I love that evolution. I, I think it's it's so fantastic, and it it speaks so much to, um, you know, just the passion of everybody on TDU's team, um, you know, for for advocacy, um, and making sure that we amplify the voices of those who who are advocating, um, you know, in, in that way. So. I wanted to ask you and, and thank you, first of all, for just going through what it took to put TDU together in the first place. Um, you know, and it's it's really wonderful to hear about musicians who just kind of banded together and, and knowing that these musicians really have a passion um, to not only be on stage, but have their voices heard in a unique way that, that combines their instrument. I just think it's, it's so wonderful to have all of these things together. Um, so I'm still curious going back to to plain chant um, and you know kind of this this medieval chant that we heard and uh, plain chant for America that lovely poem how that incorporated itself into TDU's history. Yeah so this actually owes credit to uh, James Blotchley who was um, one of two conductors that evening and he was the TDU's first artistic director and then for a time he and John McLaughlin Williams who was the other conductor that evening in, in um, for the subsequent season, they were the co-artistic directors. So this is really, um, you know, hats off to James, who is also one of the co-founders of TDU. Um, but so the title of TDU and and how it relates to Plain Chant for America. So um, when we were deciding the musical programming for TDU, one of the other sort of loose members of this initial collective was an ethnomusicologist named Micaiah Whitmer. And she really, urged us to look more deeply into William Grant Still's catalog. Uh, I was largely just familiar with his Afro-American symphony, which is um, definitely his most popular work um, in, in orchestral renderings. And wasn't necessarily a big fan of that particular piece, but she was like, no, like he has other stuff. Um, and indeed he does. He has something like over 200 pieces actually. And so, but the issue with a lot of these uh, composers is that you can see the listing of their catalog, but not necessarily be able to find the music or actually hear it. Um, so I read a lot of context about this piece, Plain Chant for America. I couldn't find any sort of recording of it at all. Like I spent week, uh, weeks, and again, this was more weird Google searches. Um, I finally found it on YouTube. And so we, this is an orchestra concert, right? Um, the, the version that I found on YouTube was a solo singer with a pianist. <laughs> so like it wasn't even an actual version of what we intended on programming. Um, and I think the, the killer to all of this was that like the title of the piece, Plain Chant for America, it wasn't, it's on YouTube. It wasn't in the title description of the YouTube video. It was like in the description text. So I was really searching hard. <laughs> Um, but I was able to find it. <laughs> and um, and and the, even though it wasn't quite what we were going to do, um, you could hear enough of the music where really we took a risk. We were like, okay, we, we know the backstory, which is incredibly compelling. Um, and we know we can hear enough of the music here where um, I think if this is in an orchestra, it's going to sound good. So let's just move forward with it. And so, as I said earlier, none of us knew what we were doing. Um, it was something like not very far away from the concert. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it was like our, our inaugural concert was in July of 2015. Um, and so maybe this was like in February or March, but we didn't have a name for this project for a very long time. 
Um, but when we were finally able to settle on really picking Plain Chant for America to be the centerpiece of the whole evening musically, then James, the conductor, he suggested, well, maybe we take the title from this opening text. Um, and we had flashed a little bit of the poem earlier, but I can just say this text now because I think it's so powerful by itself. Um, so the, the text opens with, the poem, Plain Chant for America, opens with, for the dream unfinished out of which we came, we stand together. I'm just gonna say that one more time. For the dream unfinished out of which we came, we stand together. So I think it should be noted that this predates Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. Um, I actually don't know where it stacks up with um, the Langston Hughes Dream Deferred um, but we realized that just this, this concept and this phrase, dream unfinished, really captured so many, it was evocative of so many things. And it also was tied in so beautifully with this musical selection that was really at the core of what we were doing that evening. So, so James said, let's call ourselves a dream unfinished. And I said, okay. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's really amazing. And I, I love this this dream because it really was a dream of, of yours and James and everyone just to come together and, and really put something magical on the stage. Um, and it just speaks so well um, to it. And I, I want to ask you a little bit about um, kind of this the subtext of the dream unfinished because when we talk about the dream unfinished um, we often say we're an activist orchestra and that's the other part of this. So what, what exactly is an activist orchestra? And um, I, I can see some of the roots there, uh, but how are we expressing it now? How would you say we're expressing it now? Yeah, so I remember, and you know, it's really interesting kind of looking back through even like old emails or sort of thinking about conversations we were having back then, because um, it, it's a real sort of time capsule, like, one of the big reasons why we had a concert in 2015 was because major orchestras were not talking about Black Lives Matter. Whereas like 2020, everyone saw those black boxes up, right? So like, I think that was part of it, like that really, and, and but I think this is still true now as it was then. Like when we say the phrase activist orchestra, people almost always do a double take because, you know, as, as Dr. King has described, classical music, in his words, was the last bastion of elitism. And so, you know, when you go to an orchestra, it's not to necessarily be socially engaged. Often it was to sort of, frankly, escape. You know, concert halls were seen as places of refuge that only a certain sort of people could afford to take refuge in. Um, I mean, I, I remember at one point actually, you know, being in a panel conversation about all of this and someone from the audience had said, well, but like, don't you ever just want to like turn off the noise? Like, like, why are you inviting yourself into that space? And to which I responded, well, not all of us are in a position where we can turn off the noise. Like sometimes the noise is our lived experience. Um, so I think that was part of it, in, you know, saying that because by having ourselves be an activist orchestra, that's like, even orchestras care about these things now, um, which I think is less radical in 2021 than it was when we started in 2015. But still, like, I think the way that we show up and the way that we care is still different than um, how, you know, other orchestras show up um, and, and try to engage in this work. So as far as like, what it actually means for an activist orchestra, you know, as I mentioned earlier, generally the um, the format of our programming is that we pair, um, so a lot like this YouTube show, like we pair information with music and make sure that there is some kind of very deep and uh, close tie-in between them so that uh, all of our um, seasons have operated in this model where there's some sort of central theme that's a social justice topic and then that is really what dictates all the artistic programming um, so that is in practice what the um, activism has looked like on stage mm, that's it's really powerful uh too i think the way that tdu does things just because 
it's so agile, you know, we're really able to get really get in the weeds on a topic, um, you know, and, and really dig in uh, and express the care that we all have for for these causes, um, you know, and, and do it in a way that's really impactful. So I want to, uh, I think, close us out uh, for the evening. I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground today. You know, thank you everyone for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to click the like and subscribe button. Leave us a comment in the comment section. We read every single one of those comments. So please leave us a comment. We would appreciate it. Um, and hopefully you'll be around next week for our next episode. We can't wait to see you then. All right. Thank you.